infancy from zero to three is the biggest time for the emotional brain to form. What is the impact of sleep training? This book came out in 1910 where the way of treating a baby was taken out of the hands of women and mothers and dictated to them by doctors. Talk about patriarchy. Yeah. And it was based on no studies, put the baby in the room at 7 p.m., close the door, and under no circumstances go back until 7 a.m. So the word cry it out comes from that time. They're basically, in their mind, an abandoned baby in the wild. In a cave. In a cave, exactly, yeah. with wolves around. And parents don't know. They just don't know. This really puts a wedge in that relationship. The lack of trust now, like when I need you, you're not actually potentially going to be here. Yeah. From an attachment perspective, that probably pretty good groundwork for anxious, avoidant, disorganized. Like if you had one or a few pieces of advice to give to parents that are the most important for nurture, what would they be? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Greer Kirschenbaum. Hello. Hello, Mark. Okay, I got to read out what you do so that people get some context to what we're about to dive into. Sure. So you're an author of the recent book, The Nurture Revolution, which okay. I loved. That's why I reached out to you to come on because, damn, we're going to get into that. Yeah. Dr. Kirschenbaum is a neuroscientist, a doula, an infant and family sleep specialist, a mother trained at U of T, Columbia, New York University, Yale. Damn, do you want to go to any more universities? Uh, you have combined your academic training with experience as a doula and a mother to lead the nurture revolution. So I'm so excited to have you on. I honestly, when I was reading your book, I read it before I reached out to you, and then I reread it so I could take notes of all the questions I had. Awesome. What made you write this book? Yeah. I mean, it's really my life's work. I yeah. think when I think about the answer to that question, it starts with my own experience as a baby because I was a super high needs baby, right? Some, some of us are. I needed constant holding. I cried a lot. Digestive issues. Like I had all the, all the things. And my mom really showed up for me in a nurturing way, you know, didn't leave me to handle any of that stuff on my own. I was mm. held, I was breastfed, I slept with her in bed. Um, and I kind of grew up with that story, with all those stories. I knew about them. And I grew up, because I have a, a brother four years younger, almost the exact kind of baby, mm. also treated really in a highly nurturing way. And then I saw the way other people viewed that from my mom, that that was... You know, she was weak. She was causing us to be needy, you know, all that kind of stuff by by responding. Um, so that was just sort of like the seed that kind of planted this whole interest. Um, and then as I grew up, my mom still had an influence on this. She sort of helped direct me to that interest of early life experience and how does that shape a person's mind and health. So that's where I really like narrowed in and starting in high school and then my undergrad, PhD and onwards, um, just constantly investigating how does experience in those really, really early years of life um, and the relationships we have in those years, how do they form us and shape us for better or worse? Because I had other examples of the, the former too. Well, I think for people listening too, you might not have a kid, but this can be really relevant to how we engage with children, how we were engaged with to yes. understand maybe how some of these experiences impact how we relate today, why, you know, what might be showing up as anxiety, depression, things like that, yeah. and where that can be sourced from. I mean, I was constantly in sort of like a wow, 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 reading your book, just all the different ways that. Mm -hmm it shows up as adults. Completely, completely. I have a lot of people coming to me without, who don't have babies, exactly like you said, yeah. who are like, this was just so revealing for me, for my own healing journey, because so much, when we look at that stuff, so much is like what happened, things that happened that impacted us positively or negatively, and some of it's what didn't happen. Hmm. And I think a lot of people are seeing that in the book too. Because we're not doing that for babies very much. Well, and the cultural 
conversation having an eight month old now i'm very aware i wasn't before Mm because i wasn't in the conversation yeah but now i'm very aware of if you do this with your child oh that's you're going to make them too needy you're going to make them you're spoiling them yeah like all this weird language that you're like wait what i'm we're holding them all the time we don't set them down a lot like that's not because like i want to hang out with them you know Mm -hmm. so there's this sort of inference of shame and to be fair no matter how you parent, people have opinions how you parent. Yep. Like everyone thinks their way is the way. And I think mm-hmm. that's the trap we can get into. Yep. But from a scientific basis, because I'm sure for you, you're like, well, I wanted to study the neuroscience of what it really means and yes. why it's important. So maybe we could start there. Like, how would you define nurture? Mm-hmm. And then where do we begin yeah. with that? So over the 20 years or so, I was researching and you know active in research a lot of this emotional impact came out the emotional impact of nurture in the early years so we sort of always knew like our visual system our auditory system they're all in a pretty you know critical sensitive period in those first few years the experiences that come in through our senses shape how we use our senses for the rest of our life but the emotional stuff really developed over the course of my career which is i think put me in a really great place because there was so much coming out. Oh, like the data was coming out as you were in the re- in the studying time. Yes, hmm. yes. And so I was always paying attention and, and interested in it. And so, you know, over that time, what really came out was the main brain areas we know are involved in all types of mental health, anxiety, depression, healthy relationships, uh, resilience, all of these things that we know about in mental health, all the brain areas, those were the ones that were most highly impacted by early life experience and care in the early years. And so we could see in these studies, they started in animal studies, and then you know we do that first before we look at human studies. Um, we could see that the effects of a high amount of nurturing, in the animal studies, it was a lot of physical contact, you know, hug, like, Cuddling, licking and grooming, um, as as mice and rats do, Um, nursing, and just like cozy nesting kind of contact. The pups that grew up in that environment had really different brains than ones that had even just slightly less. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it's not minor, right? Like we can look at, I can show you like the visuals of these studies, right? The, The brains are really different in these emotional brain areas. And so... You know, at the end of my scientific career, a lot of my friends were having babies. And I could see some of this low nurturing, these low nurturing practices coming through. And I was like thinking of the studies and I'm like, oh my gosh, that baby's amygdala is just (laughs) like. like, (laughs) You're like watching their amygdala grow and their frontal cortex shrink. Yes, yes, exactly. I was (laughs) like, well, parents. accurate brain description. Pretty much, yes. (laughs) <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And I'm like, they parents don't know. They just don't know. So, um, yeah, I think the answer is like those these really important brain areas, the amygdala, prefrontal cortex, uh, hippocampus, and hypothalamus as well. They are really, really different. Um, their development's really different in one context versus the other of higher and low nurturing. What is the noticeable difference? Like which parts are more developed? Are there, is there less interconnectedness? So the amygdala tends to grow. And this is again to say, this is not, you know, definitive, right? Mm -hmm. It's, we're all on a spectrum. We all have also the genetic factors. It's not, you know, we can't predict for any individual, but the amygdala, you know, would tend to be larger and more reactive in a low nurturing environment and, you know, set say smaller and less reactive with high nurturing. And the hippocampus, smaller, less ability to shut off stress mm. versus larger, great ability to shut off stress. Um, and the prefrontal cortex, um, the connections with the amygdala are affected. So the amygdala gets more connections into the prefrontal cortex under low nurturing and fewer with um, high nurturing. So that means that when the amygdala is sounding off an alarm of fear, anxiety, it gets greater access to shut off the prefrontal cortex. Oh, so it has like more off switches. 
on I switches know. for anxiety, basically. Oh, interesting. Yes. The prefrontal cortex is also where problem solving is too, though, isn't yes, it? Yes, and thinking. So when we are stressed or feeling fear, that part gets shut off. Uh, we don't have access so to thinking. So if the amygdala has more connections, it's actually activating the prefrontal cortex for anxiety. Yes. Those types of more emotions. Strongly. Instead of problem solving. Yep. Yeah. yeah, in your book, you talk about two brains, like the emotional brain and the thinking brain. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so can you speak more to that? For I was sure. so fascinated by it. Yeah, so our emotional brain processes all of our emotions, both positive feeling and negative feeling. But when we talk about the stress system, which is really what we're talking about, the main part that's developing in babies in these relationships, the stress system will alert us to threats in the environment, threats inside, and kind of alert our body, hey, there's something important here. Mobilize a stress response and, you know, survive, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and then our thinking brain can kind of modulate that response. So, you know, if, if the emotional brain and thinking brain grow up in a nurturing environment, they, they're more likely to be balanced in their connections where that amygdala can say, oh, look, oh, look, there's a threat. Something, something scary is happening. But the prefrontal cortex might be able to be strong enough to say, oh, no, we've seen that before. We not know that that's deal. not a big deal. Mm. Forget it. Right. And then that will shut off the amygdala and we don't launch into a giant stress response. But if in, you know, in a low nurturing environment, that amygdala has so much power. The emotional brain has so much power over the thinking brain that you know, a threat, even if it's a familiar one, might not be able to be calmed by the prefrontal cortex. It might not have that power, right? So that individual might be spending a lot more time feeling stress. They might be spending time in just larger and longer stress responses. And we know that that's essentially what we want to avoid to protect our mental health, right? Like what are the key years for the development of the emotional brain? Yeah. So... I always talk about the emotional brain is, you know, it's the star of the show of infancy. It starts in the womb. So stress during pregnancy is a factor. Um, and then it continues to grow for the first three years of life. So I always like to teach like babies are babies for three entire years. They're emotional babies <laughs> for three whole years. Yay. <laughs> exactly. Yay. However exhausting that is. Um <laughs> In, in the neuroscience lens, right? In yeah. some, some parts of psychology, it's up to five years. We talk about um, the behavior being like in a baby kind of stage. Um, so yeah, it's those first three years are, are really important. And I think if we understood it and supported families to understand that and support them, mental health would look really different in the world. So what does that look like? I got to think about what is the ideal nurture? So... It's the, almost the opposite of how we treat babies <laughs> in most most places I, right. I've worked in, in Canada and the U.S. at least. Um, and, and it's spreading. This kind of, like what I call, I call it like a low nurturing parenting style that we kind of have universally. Um, so high nurture is the opposite. It's really embracing the baby as a sort of fully developed, conscious, important human being right from the start and having a lot of acceptance and presence for them. Um, it's communicating with them right from the beginning all the way through those first three years and beyond, really supporting their stress. We can talk about that. That's, mm -hmm. that's really key. And, and also supporting their sleep. Those are the big areas. Yeah. So what does it look like to support a baby's stress? Yeah. So... You know, I always talk about, you know, how challenge, like, I think this is like the challenge, one of the biggest challenges of, of babies, because, you know, so many of us didn't grow up comfortable around stress or comfortable around any sort of giant emotions and others. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of us will like go and hide if we're if we're scared or sad or As a kid, yeah. angry, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Until maybe we heal and then understand that we can find support in another. So, so now we're parents and we've had that experience kind of like, oh, 
sadness, anger. Like I'm not comfortable with that. I was never comfortable expressing it or seeing it or seeing someone regulate it or model it. But then our babies are showing up with this stress like all day, every day, multiple, multiple times a day, mm -hmm. giant, giant, you know, frustration, anger, sadness. And the way it looks is to really be there, validate it, support it, be physically there. I talk about in stress, we need to essentially lend our mature brain to our babies, really, really immature brain, because they can, you know, f see a threat, they can launch a giant stress response, but they don't have the brain parts to, to regulate and calm down after. And so once we're there showing up for them, holding that, you know, imagine calming a baby, right? We're mm -hmm. giving them a giant multi-sensory experience, probably holding, rocking, singing, um, just sort of doing all these things that we know releases oxytocin into their body that, you know, will calm them. And that's the best way to show up for their stress, which I will also say we know is incredibly taxing, <laughs> um, emotionally and physically. Especially if we've never experienced that, like, uh, in your book, you talk about a bit about like if we don't have the capacity ourselves, like if it wasn't brought forward for us, yep. then having a child can trigger that that and, and really bring up our inability. Like we have to develop the ability ideally in order to provide that. Yes, we do. And that's we have to have so much grace for ourselves. Like we're going to probably those older voices of how we were treated will probably yeah. come out in us. Right. And that's, that's okay. We can, we can handle that. We can repair and, and move on from that. So yeah, knowing that that's not going to show up so quickly um, or easily, I still struggle with it. I've been parenting for five years and I still go through almost the same mental kind of process for myself to, you know, ground myself and anchor myself so that I can show up for, my son's dress. Yeah, I find when Jasper's like kind of in the losing his mind phase, you know, as a younger baby, that was more common yeah. where he would be, you know, so wound up or not able to sleep. It was usually overtired. Yes, overtired. And then I'm, you know, I have this like standard hold, mm -hmm. you know, that I would do. I know it, it's memory imprinted. Yeah. But like shushing and just like holding him, but practice knowing that from knowing from your work too, mm -hmm. that like my regulation is his regulation. Yes. So as he's stressing me out with his stress, that I have to be mindful that he's just actually moving off of me. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like a whole new level of responsibility. Yes. Absolutely. It is. It is. And I think a lot of us also, like before having a baby, we haven't supported those emotions in ourselves or others, but we also yeah, we probably don't even know how to regulate very well. Right. Because we can do lots of other things. You know, we can go out for a drink or, you know, we can go for a walk or we can go to the gym or we can go shopping, right? We can distract or dissociate from stressful feelings versus like truly know how to regulate ourselves. And, and that's important for parents to learn because like you just said, we need to be in either regulating or regulated while we show up for our baby's stress too. So what does that do for the baby's brain? Like for the development of the emotional brain mm -hmm. in a baby, how does nurturing impact? Yeah. So, you know, it has a positive effect in, in every way for the emotional brain. Um, infancy is a time, a really important opportunity to be growing, you know, what we call resilience into the, into an infant brain, the ability to, handle stress because we're all going to have so much stress in our life um but to be able to know how that feels and know how to recover from it relatively quickly it develops that ability and that is essentially the seat of all the other parts of mental health we care about right like a lower vulnerability for anxiety a lower vulnerability for depression for addiction for issues with relationships and struggles in all domains right you know, I think by firstly targeting that stress system to be pretty regulated um, and pretty resilient when stressed, that has, you know, a giant, giant effect, downstream, you know, effect on mental health. Yeah. In the book, you talk about the impact on epigenetics. Yes. 
Can you speak to that? Huge impact. Yeah. Yes. So earlier I talked about how those brain areas, uh, amygdala, and et cetera, um, how their circuitry is shaped differently by high and low nurture. Um, but the other effect is on epigenetics. And so epigenetics mean on top of genetics. So we're talking about different regulatory proteins that bind to genetics. And from that zero to three time, that's a period when the epigenetics are very easily changed in babies. And so when we're nurturing, we're really changing, you know, the other way I think of epigenetics are like volume control on a gene. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you have a gene involved in stress, for example, if we're really highly nurturing, that could turn the volume down so that gene is has a lower expression um, or turn the volume up, mm-hmm. for example, on a gene. And so, you know, we see the biggest changes in, you know, one area that's interesting to talk about is the hypothalamus. That's the area that actually releases cortisol and stress into our body. And we see in studies that when we have high nurturing, there's epigenetic changes there so that that hypothalamus for the rest of someone's life is actually not releasing huge amounts of stress, releasing lower amounts of stress. So they essentially have a lower stress system forever mm. wow. because of epigenetics. Um, so those if effects happen. Nurtured? If they're low nurtured, sorry? Um, if they're low nurtured, they'll have a really high amount of stress uh, released every time they're stressed. If there's high nurture, it will be a lower amount. So interesting. Yes. And then there's intergenerational effects. So so we're affecting that stress system with epigenetics in every way. But then we're also affecting parenting style through epigenetics. So if a baby has really high nurture, we're changing epigenetic markers on their oxytocin system and on their estrogen receptor system. So that when they eventually have a baby, they will tend to be high nurturing too. So it's like an imprint of high nurture leaves an imprint for them when they become parents to just maybe in some ways automatically just have access to high nurture. And that be their instinctual way of being. Completely. And so many people come to this work knowing that they didn't have a lot of nurture in infancy. And they really want to make a change. And it's so exciting, this epigenetic stuff, because it's like, you know, we're not going to make a perfect change in one generation. That's okay. It might take a few. But in one generation, you can really change both that baby's stress system and mental health and also leave a legacy. That's so beautiful. It is. I remember that saying, uh, genes load the gun, choice. I think it's lifestyle pulls the trigger, choices pull the trigger. Yeah. And that really speaks i know that's a very aggressive mm-hmm. uh, metaphor but it speaks to that that yes that like we can make choices today that completely alter how our children are going to be as humans in the world mm-hmm. which makes a lot of sense yep now there are people who experience low nurture who completely change how they are as humans yep and does it require the awareness of having received low nurture do you think It's a good question. I think so. I think it might not, you know, it would probably be helpful if they knew that. Sometimes they'll kind of just know, oh, I have an overactive amygdala or I have a difficulty regulating stress. Yeah. Um, And then it kind of can help. Yeah, for sure. for, For sure to know. And I think that's important in this field as well. Some people get upset or, you know, it's a bit scary, right? That between zero to three is so critical for building these emotional brain structures. And that's true. And we can also do a tremendous amount of, of, you know, healing and brain building kind of exercises. We know how long healing takes, right? It takes decades sometimes um, because it is building on that foundation of, of infancy, but you know, we can, we can grow new connections from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. That's the way a lot of therapeutics work to try to have more control over it. Uh, you know, that fear center. Um, and also remodeling within those structures can happen as adults too. Yeah. As parents, you have access to, right. There's, is there three phases when we have access to, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Can you share about that? Cause I was like, damn, that's so exciting. Yes. As a parent, you're like in the lab 
Completely. Infancy from zero to three is the biggest time for the emotional brain to form. Adolescence is another time, about nine, age nine to 14. And then when we become parents, we have huge, huge rewiring of our emotional systems and, and neuroplasticity, right? This opportunity to then, I talk about, we can kind of like remodel what happened in our infancies when, when we're parents. It's a really, really That's amazing so cool. opportunity. And, and I think the way we're set up now in this low nurture culture, you know, babies are not benefiting from that plasticity in those three years and parents aren't either. We're all it's missing for both. this opportunity to remodel our brains. Yes, completely. When, so you said that the emotional brain starts to develop uh, till like the ages of three, is yeah. it? And then the thinking brain, when does that start to be impacted? Yeah, so the thinking brain, you know, it's it can, you know, it's active in those zero to three years. It's just not able to engage in any sort of um, complex functions. So the thinking brain, their func the functions are like reasoning, future planning, impulse control, self-regulation, all these kinds of things. The circuitry for that will sort of begin to develop around age three, but it has a really long trajectory. And so it, it grows and grows and grows. Our abilities for all those things increase and it actually doesn't complete its uh, maturation until age 25. Oh shit. So we got lots of time. Mm -hmm. And then after you're 25, you're like, better have a kid if you want to yeah, rewire some things. Either have a kid or spend a lot of time <laughs> yeah. around a baby. <laughs> the What is the impact that spending time, like literal time with your child yeah. has? Yeah. This is amazing. Um, the ab Your ability to gain that neuroplasticity to reshape, you know, your, your emotional brain as a parent, um, and also your kind of ability to be nurturing for your baby, it's a dose-dependent relationship. So the more time you spend in close contact with your baby, taking care of them, communicating with them, supporting the stress and sleep, the more your brain will go through changes. Mm. So, you know, this is important for, for people who birth babies, mothers, their their changes will start in pregnancy, but the amount of time they're spending with the baby is important in the in the months postpartum. And for dads and partners, also, they also need to spend a lot of time with the baby. Their their changes wouldn't start until after the baby was born, until they could have physical contact with the baby. So it's a big argument for parental leave. You know, as parents, we should be demanding this, right? It's our health's on the line, our relationship with our baby's on the line, you know, at least for three or four months. You know, I would argue for a lot longer, yeah, but at least for too. three or four months. Yeah, I find it interesting spending a lot of the time of, in the U.S., how I think the minimum maternity leave here is something like a month or yeah. six weeks. Yeah. I can't remember. Maybe it's three months, but either way, it's short. And I think of a lot of the challenges we have in our world mm -hmm. can likely be sourced back to, from the inability to be attuned yeah. with a kid. Yeah. You know, and then what happens to us as adults, you know, because we didn't receive that. And again, like the circumstance, this isn't to blame anybody, but no. the circumstances of the world, can they themselves be so stressful that there is an inability to be tuned in? And the cost of living today often requires two working parents. Yeah. Which is wild. And when I see now single parents, oh my. I'm like, how the hell are you doing it? Like bow to you. Seriously. And like just how important village is, how important community is. Yes. You know, multi-generational homes, all that kind of stuff that really eases the the load off the mother. Yes. You know, and when you look at the neuroscience of the baby's development, is the majority of it mom? No. 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 A lot of, I mean, it, it, it's, it's primary caregiver. Oh, yeah. Okay. So first person. Yeah. The person who's spending the most time caring for baby. So if, dad, if mom happens to work and in that heteronormative sense, the yep. father then would be spending more time. Yep. That father could be the, the key component. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's super cool that yep. 
Yeah. All right. I'm about to drop some fun February facts on you. Are you ready? Now, February comes from the Latin word februa, which means to cleanse. This symbolizes new blessings and beginnings. The month's birthstone is an amethyst, which represents courage and strengthening relationships. That seems pretty apropos. February is also considered the month of love because of Valentine's Day. So in light of all that love, let's talk about Organifi's Glow. It's a delicious raspberry lemonade blend loaded with herbs and superfoods that encourages the creation of collagen and moisturizes your skin from the inside out. I love Glow and so does my wife Kylie because it's perfect for hydrating your skin and hair, which can definitely get dry in the winter months. Kylie also loves that it keeps her nails healthy and strong and her hair thicker. That's gonna be a bit of a problem for me. It's so good on its own, or you can add it to Organifi's green and red juices. In it, it's got tremella, which is known as the beauty mushroom. It increases skin elasticity and moisture. It also has acerola cherry, which is a tropical superfruit and powerful antioxidant rich in vitamin C. It has amla, which is an antioxidant rich fruit shown to increase collagen production and support healthy skin and hair. And it has bamboo silica, which is an essential mineral necessary for collagen synthesis. So if you've been looking for a high quality collagen supplement that will give you a healthy boost this February, Glow is for you. Use the code create the love for 20% off Glow and all of Organifi's other amazing products at Organifi.com slash create the love. So how does breastfeeding then impact that? Because, you know, the father bottle feeding. Right. But yeah. Like how does breastfeeding impact that development? Yeah, it's a really good question. So breastfeeding is really, really nurturing, yeah. really good for development. Um, you know, one of the human epigenetic studies shows um, compared babies who were breastfed and and bottle fed and the ones breastfed, they had the epigenetic changes happening in a, in a stronger way. And a lot of that was because of the, it's, it's physical touch, right. smell, like cuddling, that whole sensory holding. thing. Right? And the eye contact, I see Kai and Jasper yeah. being like, what's up? What's Completely. Up? Up? Yeah. And it's really just... I think it's really remarkable because it's just protected time for connection yeah. multiple, multiple times a day. Yeah. And so if someone isn't able to, um, trying to get as close as you can with bottle feeding is important because it's not necessary, right? You can kind of put in a bottle and have your attention elsewhere and all that kind of stuff. But if a parent could really try to, you know, get that baby maybe even on their chest. It's like skin to skin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, keep that eye contact going, all that communication, just get as close as they can. That would be really beneficial for sure. And the other thing is uh, breast milk has really incredible um, contents for brain development that formula cannot mimic. Right? No, the science on formula is, is poor. Yeah. High fructose corn syrup in so many formulas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know in the it was the marketing campaigns of the 50s that were like, oh, we've created something more intelligent than breast milk. Yes. It's like, what is yes. that? The fact that, well, we used to trust the authorities so much back then, mm -hmm. but they exploited that trust with lies like that. Oh, yeah. And you think of the impact of a kid getting high fructose corn syrup as a baby, like the addictive mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. the, do they look at that in studies, like the impact of formula versus... No one's, Not, fun, no one's funding that. No one's funding that. No yeah. one's funding that. There's a lot of studies on the benefits of, of breast milk, like beyond, you know, all those brain building co compounds we talk, you know, we talk about neurotransmitters. It has a, it's the immune system. Yeah. Right. The immune system of the mother is transferred to the baby. So, you know, breastfed babies don't get sick very much. Um, they have that, that immune system to rely on. Even just the sucking experience you know, by some researchers, it's described as like this internal massage it's like in the baby system. Just relaxes. Does mm -hmm. for women who can't breastfeed, is there a good source of? I think there's like breast milk share yes. things, right? I was thinking of that when you yeah. mentioned the the formula. So yeah, a lot of people are donating milk. There's milk banks, um, and you can probably find people in your community. That's um, so cool. Who are doing that too. Because that's what people used to do in tribes, right? Yep. If a woman is not the mother of the child, will they produce breast milk? They can. Yeah. yeah I was wondering They can. That. They can. Yes. So sometimes it can be induced with the presence of the baby and sucking. Um, and there's also some medications that can help. 
a supplement produce it. Yeah. Um, I've actually, one of my really good friends is a lactation consultant. I've learned so much from her. And, um, there's, she was, I love this story. There was a story of a mother who she had a baby and her mother. So the grandmother was going to be the primary caregiver of the baby and the grandmother induced lactation. Wow. And could breastfeed the and baby. And was able to breastfeed her daughter's child. Yes. That's so cool. Incredible. Yeah, because even just the nurture, just from that experience. You said that in your book that they haven't really studied many other populations in terms of the impact. But I would imagine, like, because the father's, does it have to be your offspring? Like, when you think theoretically, mm -hmm. like, if you adopt a child? Mm -hmm. then no, no, does no. not, no. You no. still develop the neuroplasticity. Yep. So just being around children a lot will open the gateway to forming new emotional completely, centers. Completely. Completely. And the the you know the kind of idea with it is to sort of having the baby release oxytocin in you. So if you so were, you release it, it releases oxytocin in them and in you. Exactly. And then that gives you access to to the brain changes. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so cool. If you adopt a baby, take off your shirt right away, hold them skin to skin, smell their head, delight in them, make eye contact with them. All of these beautiful things will be part of that transformation. So when your baby's having an emotional experience, in the book you talk about how there's they don't have to understand your language yet. So how would be sorry, let me say that again. What would be the best way to respond? verbally like not just the holding and the nurturing mm -hmm. but what are things that i could say to jasper for example even though he is currently not speaking accurate english yes uh or any well he's speaking a language yeah it's like ah, doo -doo 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 -doo. but what would be a way i could respond that would allow him to experience nurture yeah so really capturing those times where he's really engaged and alert you know bright eyes looking at you um, really interested in conversation and kind of going back and forth with him. So if he does make some of these babbling the kind best, of noises, yeah. you you can just copy them right back to him and see what he does, right? And usually that will start a really beautiful back and forth um, with the baby. So and you can, you know, you can tell them everything, right? Just, uh, you know, tell them what you did that day, Um Tell them what you're going to have for dinner, right? It's, it's, sometimes it's hard, right, to get into it for some people because yeah. it's it's a new experience. But they just they're just interested in you. They want to know learning everything, everything. Yeah, like everything. My nephew is too, and I'll say something, and all of a sudden I'll hear him repeat a word. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, wow, it's a good thing I don't. Oh, swear. they hear oh, everything. They Every do. once in a while, I'll slip. I'm the only one who swears really <laughs> around him, but I don't. I try not to. But if I happen to have my 45 years of programming, yes. just let one out. I'm like, okay. Damn. But he hasn't repeated me yet. That's good. That will happen one day. And oh, it's okay. yeah, for sure. And everyone <laughs> will look at me when Jasper does it. It's not going to be Kylie who's yeah. the cause. Yeah. Um, so my nephew is two, and he currently is mastering the word no. Yes. About everything. Yes. And I honor his boundaries. Uh how do I like for me I'm one of, I'm really fascinated when Jasper gets to that age. Mm -hmm. Like how do I allow them to explore their experience of their own development of a self? Yep. And teach them healthy boundaries because they're not necessarily in a rational space. Yes. When I say not necessarily are they at all? No. No. Yeah, okay. so can you help me? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, they all go through that that phase. It's interesting. I I've, I've noticed now with a 5-year-old every so often there's one of those phases where it's sort of you know, I don't want to say defiant, but it's really like a you know, how much like control over my life do I have right now? And it's yeah. it's it's cool. It's kind of like this like a battle time where it's like, can I do this? Like how far can I go? And it's great for their development because they feel it out and they figure out what the boundaries are and then they kind of live for a while and then they do it again. And then they probably do gain access to new things, right? Over time. Um, and I think the important thing is, is we don't want to let them do anything they want to do. Of course. Um, it's a balance of being in charge of their safety and health and also giving them that freedom, mm. right? And so 
we can upset them for sure when, you know, let's say, for example, they want to, you know, we give them one slice of cake and they're like, I want the whole thing. Yeah. Right. And, you know, if we're permissive, maybe we'll be like, all right, have as much as you want. But if we're, if that's an important value to us to, you know, have that be a boundary for safety, it's a, a, a opportunity to have a boundary and a lesson, right? To, you can make, you can be really upset. You can want that whole thing. But, you know, I'm in charge of your health and and we're going to have one. Would you today. explain it like that? I would. Yeah. Yeah. So when a two-year-old is like, wants something and you don't give it to them, mm -hmm. it's acknowledging their like, hey, I get that you're upset right now. Yep. Is it rational? Like the other day, um, my nephew was upset because I was holding a book and he wanted the book from me. Right. But I was reading it to our son. And then I was like, hey, if, if you tell me what you actually need, I can give it to mm -hmm. you. But is that even a like, does he have access to that? Am I expecting him to be able to? In the moment, they won't. Okay. So, you know, if they're in a stress state. Yeah, he was. Whether he's dysregulated, of course, he's like yeah. crying, he wants the book. He's dysregulated. He's not going to get it in that moment. You can still hold the boundary. You can say, you know, I need a couple more minutes to finish yeah. this and then, you know, and support him there. Um, but, but he will get calm at a certain point. And so maybe five, 10 minutes later, he's become, he's regulated again. Someone's probably helped him. And then you can say, Hey, you know, when I had that book before I was reading it, um, to my son and you wanted it, but I wasn't finished with it yet. So we had to wait a few minutes, you know, okay. just to like narrate what happened and, you know, it takes hundreds of times. Does that allow them to things? look in hindsight and just see what this the story was really about and so they can start to build rational sort of I guess boundaries around when they're reactive Absolutely. when they get something when they don't when something belongs to someone else yes. for a moment or yes. whatever it is and we have to just be so patient because until that thinking brain is really functioning right like we said after age three it's almost like we're just laying down you know, the little, you know, li bit by bit laying down those lessons. And so like it, sometimes it's a hundred times, sometimes it's a thousand times Feels they need like to learn thousand. those things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I look at my challenge with that age and I'm like, man, did I want to be understood so much that when they don't understand me, I'm like re-triggered by mm -hmm. it. You know what I mean? I'm like, this kid's too. He doesn't have to understand me. Yeah. Like it's not his job. It's yes. my job. Yes. And so really seeing like, oh man, have I always had a challenge with wanting people to understand me? And now he's now my teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They are teachers. Oh my they God. really teach. They're the quickest teachers. Completely. Because I see the edges of my own capacity. I see where I must access like a different level of communication mm -hmm. in order to keep the relationship a place where he feels or a child feels they can trust me. Yep. Feel safe. Yeah, yeah, for people listening who might have children who are, let's say, above three or five or 12, can you repair low nurture childhoods? Completely, yes. So many of the practices that I talk about can be applied to any age child. I've even seen adults repair this, like, like, a, like you know, a senior citizen parent and like an adult child. Yeah. Because... So much of the nur like the foundation of nurture is we want to be seen. Um, we want to be like the light of someone's life and treasured for who we are, exactly who we are, without mm -hmm. having to morph or change ourselves. And if a parent at any time can take that stance um, and start to show up for their child that way, and it's beautiful. Yeah, and to truly connect, truly look into their eyes and communicate really be there for them when they're stressed um, and feeling big feelings, it can always, always happen and always make a giant, giant change for someone. Yeah. Let's get to the real, uh, probably a more controversial subject that you touch on, which is sleep training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what is the impact of sleep training? Yeah. And where did it come from? So let's start where it came from. The origins of it seem to come in, in North America from a book published in, I think it's about 1910, 1908, by Emmett Holt, 
who was a pediatrician in America. And and think back, like this was like when nineteen oh eight. Yeah. That was that's even before lobotomies came out. Exactly. Like this is like the very <laughs> beginning of American medicine, yeah. like our our modern medicine that we have now. And during that time it was there was a germ epidemic, so called, and and that kind of was part of this um style of behavior. So before this, it was really, you know, most probably mostly mothers, grandmothers, aunts, lots of women who were nurturing babies, caring for them, probably had you know, centuries long styles of nurturing. Mm -hmm. And then this book came out, which some call sort of the beginning of what we would call scientific parenting, where the way of treating a baby was taken out of the hands of women and mothers and dictated to them by doctors. And talk about patriarchy. Yeah. Like that's yeah. such a model of exactly like we know better than mother. Yes. Than women, than mother, men. Than mammals. Yeah. <laughs> like it's all mammals so on earth. <laughs> right, right. There's yeah. a better way. Yeah. And it was based on no, like no studies, no data, no, no, you know, safety measures. Just convenience. It was, um, I think, largely based with this germ thing where they wanted babies in sterile, isolated places. And so, so the beginning of sleep training started there where they wanted, like I said, they wanted babies like in a crib for most of the day and night, um, not kissed very much to not spread germs. Um, and, and the sleep training came there. So the word cry it out comes from that time. That's uh, where cry it out came That's from. where the term cry it out comes from. They did other things in that book too, which was like binding babies' hands in metal, in metal gloves so they couldn't suck their thumbs or anything like that, which is like a cue for hunger as well. Like it's, it, it's bizarre, right? So we wouldn't do that anymore. So like, yeah, why like are we still doing sleep training? Cause they're hungry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But they have a freaking metal glove on. Yeah. I, honestly, I, I remember going to the sex museum in, uh, I think it was in Prague mm -hmm. and the fucking crazy stuff they had, yeah. like they had this machine that attached to the base. It was a ring that went around the base of like, let's say a teenage boy's oh, gosh. Uh, ding dong. Yeah. And that's the scientific term. <laughs> and if the boy got an erection, it yeah. was connected to a wire. And if he got an erection, it would set off an alarm. And so like, what, your parent would come in because you got a boner? Jesus. That you can't control while you're sleeping? Like all the wild things that we thought were... I mean, that's very much, uh, I guess, around the similar time, yeah. that Victorian, where we became very prudish, very sterile, mm -hmm. very judgmental, used really weaponized shame and, and guilt on a much higher level. Yeah. yeah. So that's where Cried Out came from. And baby, so sleep training, what would that sort of be described as? Yeah. So the, that early version, and it's still around, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is sort of an extinction method. So Emmett Holt said, put the baby in the room at 7 p.m., close the door, and under no circumstances go back until 7 a.m. So that's under no circumstances no go circumstances. back. Like your baby's hungry. Nope. Sorry. No. No. Um, and they babies will do all kinds of things like in the fight or flight state, right? It's extremely scary. That's distress. Yeah extremely scary to be alone. They don't know we have locks on the doors or homes or alarms or anything, right? Like they're basically in their mind, an abandoned baby in the wild. In a cave. In a cave, exactly, yeah. with wolves around. And um, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And so they, you know, have all kinds of bodily reactions to it. Um and it's intense. It's really, really intense. And so that that's the most extreme form. And that'll that, happen to, and in mom, that must be, and dad. But especially whoever the primary parent yeah. is, that's got to be torture in and of itself. It is. It is, absolutely. Like, you know, I talk about how the mom and dad's brain is changed specifically to be super attuned to the sound of the baby crying, to the point where like often we shower and like the squeak of a pipe, our yeah. brain will interpret as a baby crying. I can hear my nephew because we're staying at their house right now. I can hear my nephew and I'm like, 
it's like, oh, mm -hmm. is everyone okay? Mm -hmm. So attuned to that. So attuned um, to empathy. Our empathy parts of our brain get heightened as parents. So we're really feeling what our baby's feeling. And we just have that drive to, right, to hear what they need and go and help them with it. And so this, this really puts a wedge in that relationship. The lack of trust now, like when I need you, you're not actually potentially going to be here. Yeah. From an attachment perspective, that that's probably pretty good groundwork for, you know, anxious, avoidant, disorganized. Yes. Yes. So if we grow up in, I guess that would be, <laughs> that would be considered a low nurture experience. Completely. Can we nurture in other ways that will offset such a giant because that feels like a pretty big one. Yes, it's really big. And, you know, babies, you know, we talk about nurture never has to be perfect. It never has yeah. to be 24 hours a day. But it has to be the most predominant thing happening, right? It has and to be consistent. Exactly. Yeah. And reliable. And babies sleep with including naps and bedtime. It's like 50, 60 plus percent of their life. Right. And so that's a huge amount that they're not having responsive care because people do it for yeah. naps too. They'll like put them in the crib, close the door for the nap and and, and that's it too. Yeah. And you said, so there's this sort of absolute way. And then what are some other ways that we sleep train that maybe are more quote unquote modern? Yeah. So the more modern ones are called gentle, but the way that they would work in the brain are the exact same way um, as the other and actually could be actually be more distressing there's some signs of that and I'll, I'll say why in a minute um and so they include the presence of the parent so <clears throat> ferber in the 80s started the gent more gentle one where the baby is in the crib and then the parent goes in crying signaling for the parent and then the parent on the first night will go in every five minutes but not to regulate the stress they go in and say, I'm here, you're safe, I love you, you're okay. And then they go out and then they come back in every five minutes and that's do that. That's not associated with a cry, that's just they're doing that every five minutes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And they're not like picking up the baby, letting the baby relax into them. And, and they're just like, hi, back. Yeah. I'm here, but I'm not going to do anything. Exactly. Yeah. And then the second night's every 10 minutes, the third night's every 15 minutes. And so- Oh yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah. And yeah. so that- it's, it's essentially the same thing because no one is there to regulate the baby and the baby's learning. Uh, if I cry in this specific environment, no one is going to regulate me. Um, and the other one that is around a lot more now too, also called gentle, is the parent sits in a chair beside the crib while the baby's screaming. And then the second night, the chair gets a bit farther from the crib and then farther, and then eventually it's out the door. <laughs> eventually they're in bed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And those gentle ones take longer. Um, oh, my God. That would be so hard to do as a parent. Yes. But yes. for the kid, too, like at the moment you. And it's a farce. It's like making the parent think it's, it's, it's not so bad because you're there. You're like weaning them off you. But the baby's still distressed. What still about the one where people put their soothed. hands you know, because that's one, right? Where they'll be like, yeah, it's okay. I'm right here. Yeah. Usually that's not allowed. Oh, really? Usually not. Usually they're not touching. Science has said you're not allowed to do that. Yes. Sometimes you're allowed to like pat beside them, but usually not touching. That's wild. Okay. So I, th I think I should probably frame this that for anyone who's done this or experienced this, this is not to shame that. Yes. Because... My mom, when I, we were talking about this, she was like, well, you got sleep trained a little bit. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, the circumstances of our life, I get it, dictated that. Yep. And that was the predominant messaging at oh, the time. Yeah. Actually, I it know still so is. many people who are like, no, my pediatrician told me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, man, read this book, Nurture Revolution. You're not going to like it, but you're going to like it. Yeah. Because there's... There's a, it's just accepted as the way without any scientific, if anything, the scientific evidence says absolutely, if you can, mm -hmm. do not. Yes. So you, you're you saying that no matter what style you choose, the message the child receives 
is when I need you, you're not here. Yes. And the message they receive is even, it's even more primitive than that too. It's sort of like when I'm in this environment, if I call for help, it's almost, it's a waste of energy. No one comes. No one comes. And it's also might be scarier because if I signal and no one comes, maybe I'm putting myself at risk for even signaling. Yeah. So the no reason they, yeah. And the reason they stop crying is not because they're self soothing. Why is it? Yeah. So that's a big, you know, reason why people are told to do it. Babies need to learn to self soothe. They need to learn to sleep, but they can't, right? Like, no, they don't have, can you explain that? Part? Yeah, completely. So what happens in sleep training is, you know, babies will probably start regulated. You put them in the crib, you walk out, they start crying. Their, their stress levels rise. First, we go into a fight or flight stress response, and we see this happening in sleep training. Babies cry, scream, you know, thrash around, you know, all these kinds of things we know are stress state. And after that, the body goes into freeze, sort of freeze, dissociate, shut down sleep. And so they're much more likely entering sleep through that freeze, dissociate, shut down pathway Wow! because we know that they don't have the brain parts to self-regulate right and you know there's a lot of other reasons why we don't think that's happening um in babies and and so so just to finish they'll they'll probably go through that for a few days sometimes babies i've seen cry themselves to sleep for every nap and every bedtime for the whole three years so they're never actually Wait, learning whole, it so they're always doing it so they're like in a chronic cortisol state. Going to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Some will stop. Some will stop crying after sometimes sometimes it's fast, a few days. Sometimes it's a couple of weeks or sometimes months. Um, but, you know, then then we just think they've kind of learned it. So when they go into that environment, they just go straight into the dissociate sleep. So they're like, well, I'm hopeless. It's like learned helplessness. It's like learned helplessness because we know like if the baby's not in that environment, so if a parent travels, they're not sleep trained anymore. Right. If, oh, interesting. Yes. So if you like go to a hotel or something, the baby will go back to the behavior to mm -hmm. seek. The signal again. Or if the baby gets sick and then the parents start, oh, they're like, oh, they're sick. We should yeah. answer the cries. Then the sleep training's over again. And then they have people have to repeat it. The so process. there is like a repair of the relationship that seemingly happens for the child, but it then gets further evidence that my parent is inconsistent. Man, there's like really no way to sleep train and provide good care when they're sick and not provide an inconsistent message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So and a lot of people. why you pursue sorry, ambivalent people, right? Like that kind of behavior. Oh yeah, some people will say when their child is two, like even your your nephew, um, when they have the words, that's when they'll stop sleep training too, because our young babies have cries, which is totally valid communication that we can understand, but some of us we need to learn to acknowledge that. Yeah. But once they turn two, then they'll say, Hey, dad, mom. I need you. I'm yeah. scared and alone right now. And then parents then come to me and say, oh, now they're saying this. I can't leave them to sleep. I can't do sleep training now because I know that they're actually asking for it, um, for my help. But they've always been asking for help. Well, right? so that develops the emotional brain in a different way. Do, if you experience that, does your emotional brain get bigger? So it would be a risk, I will say, like, again, not deterministic. Yeah. I'm sure some people it have gone through sleep it. training yeah. and develop a, a regulated emotional brain. But the risks are that the, the amygdala grows to be more reactive. The hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are less able to shut off stress and the hypothalamus releases more stress. Like it, it can kindle that whole stress system. So then when you are in a, let's, exp let's say an experience where someone's being inconsistent as an adult or like not reliable, it can trigger that whole system. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder why you can't be in a regulated state 
using your thinking brain yep. to even say, hey, this relationship isn't a match or they're consistently inconsistent. It's being overridden by the reactivity of the emotional brain. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. For sure. So through, like, what practices can we do as adults to build our thinking brain and build less reactivity in the emotional brain? Yeah. Because, yeah. man, that feels like pretty essential work. It's it's a really essential work. And I think, you know, it goes into the realm of therapy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like what therapy works for you. Right. Like what, what Somatic, resonates CMDR, for you. Coaching. Yeah. I mean, I know people who cold water exposure can help them learn how to regulate. Yep. You know? Yep. All these can Everyone's be Everyone's different. Right. Yep. Completely. And so all of those will work to make the amygdala less reactive, to help the prefrontal cortex regulate the stress better with the connections to the amygdala. Um Hmm, that's really interesting. Yeah. The neuroscience of, because I think a lot about the benefits I've had of cold water exposure is that I can observe that my body's like, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to be like, I'm actually super safe you're right now. You're going from here. Yeah, so yeah. you're saying you can actually improve the interconnectivity, reduce the size of the amygdala. Wow, that's mm -hmm. really neat. Yeah. And the, uh, the hyperactivity of it, yeah. And the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, you can't, we don't think you can change. I don't I don't know any evidence of that. But the other parts and the hippocampus is another really great part where a lot of change happens. So we, if we're doing things like stress management, exercise, movement, mindfulness, all of those things will help keep new neurons in the hippocampus surviving. So that's this is like neurogenesis. Uh, yeah. And when we have more survival of those new cells, those also act to help our stress system, to shut off our stress system more easily. So they start to create new neural pathways that when we're in a stress state, we have access to yep, different... Yeah, we can shut it off better. Interesting. Yep. I remember when Kylie and I were first dating, I remember we got into a fight and we were both laying down on the bed and neither of us could talk. <laughs> you know, it was like both in kind of like a freeze. Yeah. Um, but through time, through both our individual practices, but also through each other, mm -hmm. we created a space where now we can dialogue and that doesn't happen. And That's if it does, amazing. there's a witness. But I just think about how much time and intentional investment that takes. But yeah. the pathology of that could be to sleep training or to inconsistent parent or low nurture, but that it is repairable, healable. It is. Yeah. It is. And, you know... I do wish for the next generation not to have to spend as much time in right. engaged like in healing as us. Biohacking their low nurture. <laughs> exactly, childhood. they will have to do some. We all will, but wouldn't that be amazing if they if they could do less, right? Just a bit. Coming back to my question about, let's say, my nephew, but even fast forward when my son is older. Yeah. How do I have a consequence that it is nurturing? I think the realm of it's sort of like gentle discipline kind of right so the behaviors that like two-year-olds three-year-olds plus they can do are probably things like hitting throwing things all that kind of stuff we have to first understand that they're in they're out of control when they're doing that they're dysregulated they're you know if they're running away they're in flight if they're throwing and hitting or biting they're in fight a uh, fight response, right? And so, so much of the way to discipline, which means to teach, right? Not to punish. Mm -hmm. The definition is to teach, um, is to be really consistent with holding boundaries, like we kind of talked about, and then also sort of reviewing the situations once they are calm. And so let's, you know, let's say they're hitting. Every time they get upset, they're, they're hitting. I'm still going through this with my son. Yeah. Um, you know, he's like, I want to punch you. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. So, <laughs> you know, when, when they're activated, we can help them use, dispel that energy that they have, right? Because they have this stress energy built up. You can say, okay, like, I'm going to hold up this pillow, punch this pillow, punch a stuffed animal, um, you know, or let's like move our body in a certain way to like move the energy. Sometimes they can do that. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes they just kind of have to go through it. Um, but we can prevent them from hurting us, right? And to really hold yeah. the boundary there and say, hitting hurts my body and I cannot let you do that. 
right? Um, and then once, you know, they usually will go through anger first and then some sadness. Um, once they're through the anger and the sadness, then we can regulate them back to calm and then review, right? To review, listen, when we're angry, we can't hurt ourselves and we can't hurt other people. So what are we going to do the next time we're feeling that way? Um, and kind of brainstorming with them, right? Can we punch the stuffed animal? Can we jump up and down? Can we kick our legs? Um, and it's about, again, that really long game. Yeah, sounds like it. Of building pathways in them that are healthy. Because again, how many of us as adults have those not very healthy patterns of being angry and hurting ourselves or hurting yeah. others, right? We need, we need to learn how to embody our emotions in a safe way. And we need to teach our babies how to do that too. And it's, it is a long game. It sounds like it. It's like, but that investment in the long game is really such an investment in our own new neural pathways of patience of yep. maybe getting something we never got. Yeah. There in the book, you talk about four questions to know that we're cherished. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share them? They're so beautiful. Sure. Yes. So these I got, <laughs> this is funny. There's a few things in the book that were on social media <laughs> that I eventually traced to the origins. And I was like, oh, that's not where <laughs> it said it was from. So this is one of them. So, so these questions are based off of interviews that Oprah had with Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou. Um, and a psychotherapist and author, Catherine Schlafer, wrote these questions out based on her her viewing of these interviews. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Inter interesting. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So online it's like, it's like, they're by Maya Angelou. And I was like, oh, how cool. I love Maya Angelou. Yeah, but it's funny, man. Based once, off of them. Yeah. yeah, once you write a quote, there's always a quote sleuth on the internet who will tell you mm -hmm. often the wrong place where they're from. Right. But they'll always want you to know. <laughs> I, I, I get that a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. But anyway, they are incredible. So the first is, do you, do you see me? And so often we're distracted. We have phones, we have work, we have dishes, right? It's, we do have to make an effort to see mm -hmm. our babies and children and each other. Uh, the next one is, am I enough for you? Or do I need to be better in some way? And in the interview, I believe it was Toni Morrison's interview. She said that when her kids would come in the room, she'd be like, oh, like straighten your shirt or tie up your laces or things like that. And then she realized that why aren't I just accepting them for exactly who they are right now? They don't need to do any of those things to have my love. And so that's sort of where that question came mm -hmm. from. And and that I think so many of us encounter that. 100%. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's really telling our babies and children, like, you don't have to do or be anything to be loved exactly how you are you are loved that that's enough um so important uh the next one is do you care that i'm here and you know this is another one where we can make an effort to show our our babies and children that we care that they're here right when they come in the room like is that reading them yeah, them yeah exactly you know, I think we can get lost in the busyness of life and the shuffle, like pick them up from school or daycare or, you know, a program and just be like, all right, let's get in the car. Let's get on your, here's your snacks and, you know, all the things instead of just being like, wow, it makes my heart feel so good to see you. Like, you know, you light up the room. You know, I tell my son this all the time and he really does and he should know. Um, so that's a really important one to, to take note of as well. And the last one is, can I tell that I'm special to you by the way that you look at me? And again, that's that full radical acceptance and love of the child in front of us. And again, in our kind of really demanding parenting landscape where we're like, when are they meeting that milestone? When are they, you know, going to eat well? When are they, you know, all these things that we put pressure on our children. And sometimes we're like, oh, I wish that you were faster or you know, ate better or yeah, all the things we're cleaner or, you know, we have those things in our mind, but that shouldn't ever get in the way of them feeling special, right? Exactly 
exactly how they are. It's amazing how much we could trace back things like achievement orientation or perfectionism when it's sourced from that one question of, uh, am I enough for you or do I need to somehow be better Mm -hmm. in order to be loved by you? That's such a painful experience for people, but so true. It's like, oh, you got an a B plus, why didn't you get an A? Yep. And it's like the message that's constantly being sent. Completely, completely. What is, like if you had one or a few pieces of advice to give to parents that are the most important for nurture, what would they be? I think the overall message to get across to parents is just really how enormous an opportunity it is to give a baby, your baby and yourself, this, this gift in early life. I think there is no greater gift in the world that you could give a baby or a parent um, more than nurture. It's, it's, yeah, we talked about the stress system. We talked about mental health, but that gift of nurture in those early years, it's something that a human, a baby, a parent, they're going to need and use every second of their whole life. It's like hard to communicate how large a gift this is. It's that feeling of being enough, loving yourself, having compassion and kindness, thoughtfulness, really being able to get joy out of life and awe out of life and connect with people deeply love the earth, right? All these things we we wish for, everything we wish for, for our children can happen in those early years. And so whatever sacrifices or ways we have to bend ourselves in this, you know, difficult society to get it, it's, it's just so worth it. It's so worth it in every way. How has everything that you've learned about nurturing and the neuroscience of it how has that impacted your interpersonal relationships? Oh my gosh, so so much, so I bet. much. Com- yeah, absolutely. I think that, and so many parents come to me with this too. That that the relationship between me and my son, I I I know it's changed everything in my in my being. You know, my compassion for myself and others has grown. Um, so much trust in others. So much ease in relationships have come out of of this relationship it's it's been so transformational for me yeah i imagine just the level of knowledge you have about how it changes the brain that we can through relating like that with other people help shape their experiences differently like they might never have received some sense of nurturing yep you know and that's not to infantilize people but to you know to really provide genuine care, which I think for some of us, that could feel like a challenge mm-hmm. because maybe we didn't get it. Yes. And then we stay stuck in the, well, it's not fair. I didn't get it. So you should give it to me, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but this work of being able to provide it is, it's the gift. Yeah. Yeah. It really has the potential <clears throat> to change, really change the future. Yeah. I yeah. agree. And I loved your book and thanks for taking the time to come on the pod. Thanks, Mark. For people listening, where can they find more of your work, um, more about you, and also get the book? Yeah, absolutely. So I have everything on my website, nurture-neuroscience.com, and my Instagram, uh, nurture neuroscience parenting. I have lots of lots of freebies, lots of workshops and courses and all kinds of new things awesome. I come out with. Yeah. We'll make sure we link it all out. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.